So if you've got your Bibles, please turn to Romans chapter 6. We won't be too long this morning, but I, I, I want to share some things out of this chapter. Before I went away, we started a new series entitled Grace, the Power to Reign. Amen. Grace is more than just what God has done for us. It's what he's doing in us and what he's doing through us. Grace empowers us to reign in this life. And uh, we're going to share about that this morning. So if if you've got your Bibles open to Romans chapter 6, I'm just going to read three verses. And if we can just get a hold of these verses this morning because they encapsulate the Christian life cannot think of any better way to sum up the Christian life than these three verses, especially the last verse that I'm going to read you. Starting at verse 3, do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, Even so, we also should walk in newness of life. Here's the summary. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Wow. That's powerful. That is really powerful. I've entitled this session, The Finality of the Cross and the Power of the Resurrection. The fact is, friends, We live this life not in our own strength. You cannot live the Christian life. I cannot live the Christian life. There's only one person who could live the Christian life, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. But he gives that life to us, his resurrection life. Amen? But we will never experience the resurrection power of Jesus until we believe in the finality of his death. You know, when I started preaching the grace of God, for a while, people just weren't getting it. And I couldn't understand why they weren't getting it. And then God spoke to me. You know when God speaks to you. And God spoke to me and he said, you need to preach grace as Paul taught it. So I went to Romans and I saw that, you know, before Paul really opened up about the life of grace, living in the energy of his grace, he spent the first five chapters speaking about what Christ has done for us at the cross. What took place there? We call that the great exchange. We've talked about that many times. But we constantly need to be reminded of it because some people just don't live in that, you know? What happened at the cross? He became what we are so that we could become what he is. Amen? God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might be the righteousness of God in him. The great exchange. All my sin, past, present and future, was laid upon him. And he took its judgment from God completely and said it is finished, which in Greek is just one word. It means it's completely completed. It's perfectly perfected. It's done. The sin question's been dealt with once and for all. Amen. It's finished. And then he gave to us his righteousness. That's the great exchange. That is the great exchange. But we will never experience the power of the resurrection life in us until we understand and believe in the finality of his death. Now, a lot of people think, that the secret to getting power in their lives is if you fast more, you get more power. If you pray more, you get more power. If you sacrifice more, you get more power. If you give more, you get more power. Can you see who the focus is on? It's on you. It's on you. The fact is, friends, it's no more about us. We died with Christ. We were crucified with him. This is what these verses are telling us. When Jesus died on the cross, we were baptized into him. We were united together with his death. So religion will get you to focus on you again. 
get you to put all the attention back on you. That's when you know you haven't really believed in the finality of, of, the, of, of the death of Jesus. When you're still focusing on yourself, examining yourself, looking at yourself. And, and that's what the devil will, will, will get you to do. You know, much, much of Christianity today is still talking about their sins. Man, you know, when, when I was in Indonesia, question time, 90% of the questions were about our sins. Our sins. You know? People are more sin conscious than they are sun conscious. Confessing their sins instead of confessing their righteousness. Trying to deal with their sins one by one. Confess, repent. Confess, repent. Confess, repent. Friends, Jesus made one offering once for all and perfected us forever. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. That's true. Some Christians are still trying to die to self. Still trying to die to self. Well, the Bible says, you died. <laughs> you died, friends. You're crucified with Christ. So anything we try to do that gets the focus back on us is a dead work. When we try to do what Jesus has already done, that's a dead work because it's finished. It's finished. It's no longer about us. I'm so glad about that. You know, in churches today, people project guilt onto other people. They, they're into guilt tripping, you know, making people feel guilty, manipulating by guilt. We shouldn't be doing that. Paul said this, I'm determined to know nothing among you except for Jesus Christ and him crucified. And from this point on, he said, we'll know nobody according to the flesh. As far as we're concerned, the people we used to be in the flesh, we died with Christ. We're now a new creation. It's Jesus now. It's the life of Jesus in us. Hallelujah. Let's go to Romans chapter 8. Let's just turn over the page for a moment. Romans chapter 8 and verse 8. It says, so then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Now, those that are in the flesh are those who are not saved. Those who are still in Adam. They can't please God. Doesn't matter what they do. Doesn't matter how hard they try. They cannot please God. But, verse 9, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, when we got saved, we were baptized into Christ, and Christ came to live in us. We are now not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, well-pleasing to God. There's two times that, at least two times anyway, in the Gospels that we read that, that the Father spoke directly to the Son. You remember the first time? At his baptism. Jesus came to the River Jordan where John was baptizing sinners and he presented himself at a sinner's baptism. And John was shocked. He said, I should be baptized by you. You have no sin. What are you doing here? And Jesus said, let it be so now, because in doing this, we are fulfilling all righteousness. What did he mean? He was enacting what was going to happen at the cross. As he went down into the waters of baptism, and he was immersed in that water, it was a picture that on the cross, the judgment of God would pass over him because of our sin. He would bear its just judgment. Hallelujah. But then as he was brought up out of the water... It was a picture that he was the head of the new creation that is complete and perfect in him. And you know what happened at that point? Heaven opened and God said, this is my beloved son. In him I am well pleased. Hallelujah. And when God looks at you, he sees Jesus and says, in you I am well pleased. You don't have to do something to make God pleased with you. And anything you do cannot make God not pleased with you. Amen? That's the wonder. That's the good news of the gospel, dear friends. The other time that God spoke directly to Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration. When he went up into the Mount with Peter, James, and John, they fell asleep, you remember? And then when they were awake, they saw Moses and Elijah. And Jesus was shining in all his glory, just brightness that 
they said you, you, you can't describe it. There's nothing you could compare it to on earth. Such brightness. He was being glorified. And, and Peter didn't know what to say. And he said, Lord, do you, want, do you want us to make three tabernacles? One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. In other words, to detain them. And the father spoke again. He said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Hear him. But they just didn't get it. Jesus was shining. They had no glory. That They were not shining. Why? Because Moses and Elijah represented the law and the prophets, the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, which is a fading glory. But Jesus represented the New Covenant, the ever-increasing glory. And when we're in Christ, that's the glory we're in, the ever-increasing glory of God. And God is well pleased with us because we are in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow, isn't that, isn't that amazing? That is absolutely incredible, friends. You know, uh, we just saw a, a phrase there about being in the flesh. Those that are in the flesh. What does that mean? Those that are in Adam. Now, Adam was born innocent, right? Adam was born innocent. This is why you don't need to be in Adam. Because when an innocent person sins, their sin is imputed to them. And they're no longer innocent. They are guilty. But we are not in Adam. We're in Christ. Therefore, we are righteous. And that means when a righteous person sins, their sin is not imputed to them, but it's already been imputed to Jesus. And they remain righteous. That's the big difference. That's the big difference. Now you say, wow, people could, could use that and, 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 and run off into sin. Well, I'm sorry about what people might do with that, friends. But I'm sharing this with people who are so laden down with guilt and condemnation because they think that every time they've sinned or fallen, they fall out of favor with God. They lose their righteousness and come back under condemnation. You know, David got a vision of this. Remember, David committed two sins that were worthy of capital punishment. Should have been put to death. Murder and adultery. Under the law, there was no forgiveness for those sins. And he said this, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. He understood. He got a, a revelation like Abraham did of what it means to be righteous by trusting in Jesus. He believed in Jesus. That's very clear from the scriptures. He believed in Jesus and was made righteous. And he knew that God did not impute his sin to him. Friends, every day we, we get up, we should say this, blessed is the man, the woman, to whom the Lord does not impute sin. Amen? Whatever, if you blow it during the day, you need to know that God is not going to impute that sin to you because it's already been imputed to Jesus. Hallelujah. Then he said, David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom the Lord imputes righteousness apart from works, apart from anything we've done, not on account of our doing, but because of Jesus. That's the great exchange. And, and, and you know, unless we understand the finality of the cross, we will always look to our behavior to determine our status before God. You know, God wants, us, wants to take us beyond the cross. That's why I've called this the finality of his death and the power of his resurrection. God wants to take us beyond the cross. So often we, we talk about coming to the foot of the cross, which is not a, a biblical statement. But, but Jesus didn't die to bring us to the foot of the cross. Amen? He took us to take us beyond the cross into his resurrection life. Let's just have a look at this. He said, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Jesus came to give us life. Why? Why? Because we were dead. <laughs> we were spiritually dead. We don't need a law. We don't need a, a, a pep talk. 
We don't need a motivational talk. We need life. Amen? And Jesus said, I've come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. And all the way through John's gospel, he kept saying, this is why I've come. This is why I've come. Not to bring you to the foot of the cross, but to take you past the cross into the resurrection life. I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. He says, for as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. And then he says in the same chapter, talking to the Pharisees, he said, you search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me, but you're not willing to come to me that you may have life. And then this one we all know, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Amen? He doesn't show the way. He is the way. He doesn't speak the truth. He is the truth. He doesn't just give life. He is the life. He that has the Son has the life. I'm going to explain what that is in just a moment. In the same chapter, he said, because I live you will live also. He says this all the way through John's gospel. Then just in case we missed it, he sums it up right at the end and he says these, John says, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Hallelujah. Now, I want to share with you uh, this morning just a, a couple of what, what the Bible calls mysteries. You know, John, uh, Jesus rather spoke about many mysteries. And, and, and the apostles also, especially Paul, spoke about several mysteries. Now, when we use the word mystery, we use that word in the sense of we can't understand something. It's a mystery. Can't figure it out, you know. But the Bible uses that term in a different way. It means something that's hidden from us, but now God has revealed it to us. So we can know it, not by reason, not by trying to figure it out with our human reason, but by coming to the Word of God and receiving the revelation that He has given to us. Now, there's two mysteries I'm going to share with you this morning. First of all, the mystery, what the Bible calls the mystery of iniquity, the mystery of lawlessness. That's the first one. And then the second one is the mystery of godliness. Those things are a mystery to the world and the church unless we come to the revelation of the Word of God. Don't try to figure those things out in your mind. Come to what God has revealed about those two things. So let's look at the first one very briefly. The mystery of iniquity. Why do people behave the way they do? That's a good question. We're living now in the 21st century and uh, even in our generation, even, even currently, we're witnessing a nation destroying hundreds of thousands of its own people. We're witnessing genocide in our day and age. We're witnessing people going to war with each other. In spite of all the technological advancements, all the, you know, the better standard of living that we have today, we're seeing these things rampant. Nothing's changed. Nothing's improved in that realm. On, on, on a personal scale, you know, in individual relationships. People hate each other. We see murders every day. People avoid each other. People get angry with each other. This is in modern society. And, and even set that aside, people can't live with themselves. They're suffering with things like anxiety, fear, anger, depression. So what's going on? How do we explain that? Now, man tries to work it out with his mind Psychology, psychiatrists, all that sort of thing. And they come with all sorts of theories. In fact, there are hundreds and hundreds of um, schools of psychoanalysis theory. In other words, what I mean by that is that we've got different explanations why people behave the way they do. And none of those explanations agree with each other. There's no consensus. Isn't that amazing? Out of all the, the, the best the world is able to come up with, we just got a whole lot of ideas that don't agree with each other. Now, why is that? Because people try to understand it without going to the core issues. They try to deal with the fruit of the problem. So when people go for counseling, they get behavior modification. 
uh, just rearranging the furniture, just tips on how you can cope better, how you can manage your situation. That's the best the world can come up with. I say this, when all else fails, go back to the manufacturer's manual. <laughs> Amen? Let's go back to what the Word of God says about why man behaves the way he does. And if you go back to the beginning, and I don't even mean the garden, go back even beyond there, right to the first sin which was committed in heaven. The Bible says this, that Lucifer originated the first lie and believed that lie. Now, what was that lie? The lie was this. You don't need God. You can be God. You can be disconnected from God and have life, still have life. He believed that lie and he died. This shining, great, uh, dazzling angel died. Lucifer became Satan, the devil, was cast out of heaven with a third of the angels. But then what happened is he, he brought the same lie to mankind. Let's just have a look. Down here we see the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. There's a corpse that even God had created. Man didn't create himself. There's a corpse, no life. He's, the only life he had is the life that God breathed into him. He was dependent upon God. That's the truth. All life is dependent upon God. Amen? And then Satan come along and said this, you don't need God, you can be God. You can be disconnected from God and still live. God said this, don't eat that, that fruit nor touch it lest you die. If you turn from me, if you disconnect from me, you will be cut off from life. You will die. So he had a choice. Am I going to believe God or am I going to believe God? the lie of the devil. He believed the lie of the devil that he could be disconnected from God and still have life. And he died. That's the mystery of iniquity. Let's turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. That's the mystery of lawlessness. It's Satan working through man or behaving, if you like, through man when man believes the lie. As soon as man believes the lie, I can disconnect from God and still live, then he's given Satan access to his life. And, and Satan behaves through him. So let's read that phrase in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 7. It says, For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. It's, all, it's been at work from the beginning of time. Go down to verse 9. It speaks about the coming of the Antichrist where, where Satan's power will, will, will find its climax in one individual. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. And with all unrighteousness, uh, sorry, unrighteous deception amongst those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. What's the truth? The truth is only in God is their life. All life has come from God. All life depends upon God for its maintenance. But people did not receive the love of the truth. They didn't love that truth. Verse 11, and for this reason God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe the lie. Not just a lie, the lie. What's the lie? You can be disconnected from God and still live. You don't need God, you can be God. That they all might be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, the mystery, of, the mystery of lawlessness then is Satan working through man who has believed the lie. Jesus said this to the Jews. He said, you are of your father, the devil. Wow. How would you like someone to say that to you? Your father's the devil. <laughs> You are of your father the devil and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning. He was the first one to destroy life. And does not stand in the truth. What is the truth? Only in God is their life. 
because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. He was the one that invented lies. Now you might say, that's, that's okay for really bad people. Now that was us. That was us. That's how we came into this world. Amen? Jesus would have said that to us. You're of your father, the devil. You've lived as if there is no God. That you are, as if you are the, the cause of your own effect. As if you have life within yourself. That's us. Paul said that. He said, you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. That's scary, friends. Satan once worked in us because we believed the lie. Because we believed the lie. Why was that? Because everyone that's come from Adam... Everyone that's come from Adam has been tainted with death. Through one man, sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men. Wow. This is why people behave the way they do. Psychiatrists don't like to hear this. Psychologists don't like to hear this. But it's the truth. And unless we believe that, we're only going to deal with the fruits of the problems of society, not the roots. Amen? That's why the gospel gets to the root of the problem. And the fruit of the problem is you must be born again. Hallelujah. Now, we're, we're coming up, getting ready now, getting towards Christmas. And, and that's why it's important with all the festivity that's going on around Christmas to understand what happened at Christmas. What happened at Christmas? At Christmas, God sent another man into the world. Because every man has come from Adam, right? Everyone is like Adam. Everyone has death. So God sent another man into the world. Not the fruit of Adam. Someone that was born in the womb of a, a virgin. That's why we, we, we believe in the virgin birth, what we call the incarnation. Just as God breathed into Adam's corpse the breath of life and he became a living soul, so God did the same with Jesus. Jesus, though he is God, he came as a man. Though he is God, he did not live as God, he lived as a man. Amen? Amen. Lived on earth as a man. And God imparted the seed of life into the womb of Mary so that he did come in the likeness of sinful flesh. He had a body like you and I. He had a body that was subject to all the restrictions, the weakness, the tiredness, the hunger and so on as you and I. But his nature was the nature of God, was the life of God, the divine nature. Hallelujah. So we've got two men now. Think, no, we've got millions. No, there's only two men as far as God is concerned. The Bible calls Adam the first man and Jesus the second man. Adam the first Adam, Jesus, the last Adam. So there's only two. Amen? Now there's a difference. And the difference is this. God gave life to Adam. God gave life to Jesus. But before Adam had any seed, what did he do? He sinned. So he could not pass life onto his descendants. He passed on death to his descendants. Jesus had life. He never, never sinned. So he gives what? Life. He gives life. Look at how Paul puts it here. Sorry. So it is written. The first Adam became a living being. God gave him life. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Hallelujah. Praise God. When Jesus said, I've come that you might have life, that's what he was referring to. He would give us what we needed more than anything else. We needed life. Praise God. And, and, and so if, if the mystery of iniquity is Satan behaving through man 
on the strength of the lie, what is the mystery of godliness? Well, it's God behaving through man who believes the truth. Talking about Christmas again, we read this. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. That's what godliness is. At Christmas, God filled another human being and God poured his life through Jesus. Now we've got to understand, you know, people say, oh, but Jesus was the son of God. It was okay for him. Listen, though he was the son of God, he lived as the son of man. He laid aside his glory. He subjected himself to all the restrictions and the limitations that you and I are under. He lived as a man. He got hungry. He got tired. He got frustrated. He got tempted. He got all those things that you and I experience, yet without sin. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he said this. He said, most assuredly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the father do. For whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. You know what he's saying there? He said, I am not the cause of my own effect. Godliness is learning to live in dependence upon my father who will pour his life through me. I can't do anything of myself. I cannot originate one thought. I cannot speak one original word, do one original action. Everything I do is the Father working through me. And he lived all his life like that, showing us what godliness is. What does it take to be godly? In one word, God. <laughs> Amen? This is why so often the church has got it wrong. Yeah, preaching and counseling, it's all about striving after holiness. <laughs> Trying to manufacture something. That's not the Christian life. Or here's another one, character building. <laughs> what are you going to build character with? The flesh? Paul says, in my flesh dwells no good thing. I, I can't produce one good thing from my flesh. But my life is available to God. As I offer my body as a living sacrifice to him, he pours his life through me. That's godliness. I don't have patience, but the fruit of the Spirit is patience. You know, that bulb up there that's shining on me right now, you know, it's got a lot of light, and yet it has no light. If you disconnect that from the power source, there's no light. There's no life in it. It depends on the source of power to give it light. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. And he meant exactly that. You have the capacity of shining forth my glory, but it's my glory. It's my life in you. That's the Christian life. He that has the Son has the life. You know, I think the church has come a long way in terms of really understanding, and we celebrate this every week, that Christ is our righteousness. Amen? But Christ is also our sanctification. We kind of think that Jesus got us so far, now we have to take over from there. You know, we, having begun in the Spirit, as Paul says, we, we try to be made perfect in the flesh, in our own efforts. Friends, it's no longer about us. We died, remember? We died with Christ. But we've been raised to newness of life, his life, living in and through us. Let's go back to uh, Romans chapter 6 as we finish up this morning. Romans chapter 6 and verse 5. I just want to read this verse in summary. This encapsulates is a summary of the Christian life and I'm going to share more about this over the next few weeks but in verse 5 it says if we have been united together in the likeness of his death praise God we have it's finished the sin question the self question it always dealt with at the cross it's no longer about us amen 
Now, if we've been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be, that's now, in the likeness of his resurrection. We will experience his resurrection life flowing through us. And you can only experience that if you understand and believe in the finality of the death of Jesus, of the finality of his work on the cross. It's finished. It's done. Everything God has ever demanded or ever will demand of you, Jesus paid for at the cross. He made you a new creation. That new creation is, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. Not I. It's not about Ken Leg. It's not about you. Nevertheless, not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Right, right now, you know, you're going through some stuff right now. It's not about you. You can't, but he can. Amen? You can't, but he can. Hallelujah. And so it's about looking to him and living in his resources. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God. Wow. That's exciting, friends. That's exciting. That we can experience resurrection power life every moment of every day because of Jesus. Let's pray together.